<laughs> hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Jared Poirier, and welcome to my movie review show, where I talk about movies. So if you guys have been watching my channel for a while, uh, you'll know that every once in a while, uh, I get tired of listening to my own voice, and I like to have a special guest on. And uh, I got to say, this guy, this guy is probably the most special guest that we've ever had on the channel. And I'm very excited to welcome him here. We actually have uh, the director of about 35 feature films, as far as I could count, uh, including the subspecies films and the movie that we're going to be talking about today, which is a 1986 classic cult film, Terror Vision. So, Ted, welcome to the show, man. Uh, is there anything that I missed in that introduction? Bring us up to speed on what you've been working on, my friend. Ah, that sounds good, Jared. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, uh, so basically, I think you got it right. I'm not sure if it's 35 or maybe a few less, but... Um, That's what okay. IMDb says, so we'll, we'll go with that. Wow, okay, maybe including editorial, because I started out as a film editor and there you go. Uh, moved on to directing with television was my first feature, actually. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been working lately doing little bonus features and documentaries for the Disney company for Disney classic film releases and tell them the stories of Walt Disney and his artists and awesome. still trying to put movies together. Yeah, sweet, man. Yeah, you just never uh, stop working. So that's good. Obviously, you have a uh, passion for it. And uh, obviously, all that stuff was on display here with uh, Terror Vision. Um, this is a movie that uh, I got turned on to by a friend of yours, Ray Bright, right? Um, yeah. I, I guess uh, I guess you've done a little bit of work with him before in the past? Yeah, Ray was a line producer on a couple of movies okay, that, I, well. that I did in Romania. We spent some quality time together and some horrible time together in a children's <laughs> hospital uh, taking wow. care of one of our kid actors that got injured. Oh, wow. Uh, so we kind of went through battle together, yeah. Crazy, crazy. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed uh, having him on the show, and I guess you guys have been through some battles, so you're still pretty close uh, all these years later, so that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. We live on opposite sides of the country, but uh, I'd love to see him again sometime, yeah. Cool, yeah, I'd love to uh, travel down there and see him maybe do a video in person or something like that, but uh, we're here to talk about TerraVision, and uh, this is a movie that I watched uh, for the first time about two weeks ago, so I remember it pretty well. And uh, just doing a little bit of uh, research on it and stuff like that for this video. Um, yeah, uh, this is a movie that I really liked just because uh, I'm a big fan of that type of genre of like the uh, the cult movies, the especially like sci-fi horror movies, which I guess is uh, something that you're obviously into. You've made quite a few of them. Um, I was kind of curious uh, going into this interview here. What was it that really, like, about the, the sci-fi horror genre in particular that had you so interested that you were like, I got to make uh, sci-fi horror movies? Uh, well, when I was a kid, my father would take me every Saturday to uh, matinees of science fiction and fantasy and horror films uh, in Dallas, where I grew up. And uh, so I kind of gained a love for those movies in the 1950s, kind of flying saucer invasion films and the giant monster movies. And uh, between those Saturday matinees and then the Saturday evening kind of late night horror -thon kind of shows that were on Channel 11 out of Fort Worth, uh, kind of established in me kind of this love of the genre. Right on. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That was uh, a huge thing for, for me as well. I'm actually more of a, a fan of more of the uh, modern sci-fi horror movies and particularly some of the more like art house ones. Uh, yeah, like some of the stuff that A A24 has been putting out, they're still doing a lot of that type of stuff. Um, yeah, so that makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah, the other thing that I definitely wanted to talk to you about uh, was some of your inspirations, uh, maybe some other directors in that field that, uh, you know, or even outside of that field, making any any type of movies. Like, what are your kind of big inspirations, directors wise? Directors wise, I went to film school at the University of Texas, and uh, I started out in pre med, and and then switched over to English, thinking I was going to be a writer. Uh, but then I saw two films that really kind of changed my life, and one was Ingmar Bergman's The Seventh Seal, 
and the mm -hmm. other was Fellini's uh, uh, Juliet of the Spirits. And those two films kind of made me see that everything I loved about music and filmmaking and writing uh, could be kind of combined into this art form of cinema. And so, so those were my two, first two conscious uh, inspirations were those two directors. Yeah, so and, you're, and you're saying that you were coming from more of a writing background and stuff like that before? Writing and rock and roll, I was playing in bands. Oh, and, wow, okay. and, uh, so I kind of basically took everything that I loved about writing and music, and I was also making little short films with some friends of mine right. from high school. Uh, and so everything, I saw how that, how film just combined all of the arts. And, well, uh, yeah, that is what, one of uh, my favorite things about film, of course, is just the, the sheer fact that you're bringing so many different art forms together. It's almost like it's the ultimate art form because you're talking about like narrative and camera work, lighting and music, of course, all of those things coming together. So and yeah, working definitely. with people, working with people, which is kind of the the main thing when you're making a film. Oh yeah, well, just like with uh, with this type of video, I you know I can do a certain type of video if I do it myself, but if I collaborate and I bring some other energy into it, I find it usually improves it. So yeah, yeah. Sweet. Um, yeah, just another kind of thing that I was thinking about while I was watching this movie is uh, like you were saying um, the idea of everybody getting along, everybody working together. I thought that you put together uh, a really good team uh, for this movie, uh, a bunch of pretty uh, eclectic, pretty weird characters that actually was one of the things that I really liked about this film was just how different uh, the character the characters were from other movies. Um, you don't see a lot of mainstream films with swinging parents in it or stuff like that. So oh, yeah, I kind of one. <laughs> oh, go, <laughs> go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, sorry. Uh, yeah, I was. Uh, I, I must have been a little bit too stoned or something when we when I was coming up with that story because I I wanted to make a movie that was going to kind of get into you know twelve year old kids' heads when they saw it on television and be sort of like a a nightmare that they couldn't quite place. Right. Uh, but when I got to Rome and saw all of the erotic art that was on the walls, you know, suddenly changed the tone of the movie quite a bit you know the swinger swinging parents all of that <coughs> somehow i thought i could get away with that in the yeah. realm of a movie for teenagers but it was it, it, it was quite a stretch you know? yeah I, I liked it that's what like one of the things that uh set the film apart from other movies to me like uh originality wise was just like how yeah just <laughs> what, type, what type of characters you decide to put in there but i was wondering like uh Maybe it was um, you had some kind of uh, producer choosing the cast, or like how did you put the uh, this cast together? Basically, uh, in those days at Empire, Charlie Band, uh, you know, ran Empire, and he was uh, yeah, of course a great salesman and a great uh, kind of put, putting to, great at putting together packages of people. Yeah, and he uh, went on to make the like some H.P. Lovecraft movies or something like that. Yeah, it was Stuart Gordon. Stuart Gordon directed some H.P. Lovecraft movies for Charlie, and Charlie ended up producing yeah. the Puppet Master series and Subspecies. So Charlie's been part of the kind of genre, low budget genre, and direct to video world for part of that world yeah. forever. You know, since the beginning of VHS. But in those days at Empire, he would come up with uh, posters and then present you a poster and say, okay, can you come up with a story based oh, on really, this eh? poster? So the poster that was presented to me for television was a big monster coming out of a television set <coughs> and a satellite dish. And yeah. so I said, okay, if I can, I, and by this time I had been editing a number of films for him. So I knew kind of what what you could accomplish on the budgets. I knew John Beekler, the, the makeup effects guy, and what he was capable of doing. Uh, and I said, okay, I'll do this if I can make it a comedy. And to Charlie's credit, he agreed. Um, nice. the, the casting of the film was kind of the, basically the, the story of any casting. You kind of get a casting director, he proposes a bunch of actors. You start meeting actors and seeing which ones and, and auditioning them and seeing yeah. which ones agree to come to see you. Uh, Garrett Graham uh, came to us after a few other people fell out. And um, when he read for the part of Stanley, he was just yeah amazing. 
Um, Mary Warrenoff I brought in uh, thinking that she would play the part of Medusa. But uh, when she came in to meet us, she said, you know, the part of Medusa is the part that everybody would have me come in to read for, but the part I would really love to play is the mom. Right, so because she didn't nobody want to do the obvious role, right? She wanted to kind of... <laughs> right, she wanted something completely un, un, uh, expected for her. I like and, that. Uh, yeah, yeah, and when somebody comes in and says that to you, and I love Mary Warnoff and loved her work and eating Raul, and, uh, and I had seen her around at uh, Club Lingerie, this uh, nightclub in, in L.A., been uh, running into her off and on over the couple of years before. So... Uh, when something like that happens and she read for the part, it's just suddenly it just shifts your perspective on the whole film. Uh, Jonathan Grice came in and read for OD. And uh, though he was older than uh, the character was supposed to be, uh, when he put on the wig and, and yeah. did his OD act, he was spectacular. We read uh, quite a few uh, actresses for the part of Susie. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, even met with Belinda Carlisle of the Go-Go's and uh, see if she would be interested in doing it. But uh, when Diane Franklin came in, it was just, you know, one of those moments where you go, oh, okay, she's got the energy, she's yeah, got the super, kind of perkiness. Super, super bubbly gave you that kind yeah, of Yeah, super cute. type of vibe. Yeah. Uh, and let's see, uh, oh, uh, 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 Let's see, Alejandro Ray came in and, you know, with his history on The Flying Nun, it was just so perverse to have him play the Greek swinger. Excellent. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so basically the casting kind of came about just in, in a real natural way. But okay. we were very lucky in those days. Charlie was actually able to pay union yeah. scale, at least for actors. I would say that like uh, the two big standouts for me, uh, I did like the actor uh, portraying Stanley like that. That character for me was one of my favorites, uh, and the grandpa character as well. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's hilarious, like, and uh, just like the perfect uh, caricature caricature of that character. I was just like pretty pretty impressed with how you could find somebody who fit that so well. So, yeah, yeah, he was he was truly amazing. Yeah, yeah. and even the little boy. I mean, a lot of the time that that can kind of be uh, one of the big hurdles to get over anytime that you're making kind of a horror movie or really any movie at all is like when you get the kid actors involved so you got a good one there as well that i yeah really was acting so chad allen yeah. he came in and his, you know his parents were very uh christian and oh. uh, when they came onto the set and saw the art they <laughs> kind of begged me to never frame chad in a shot with uh with the art Oh, uh, it didn't, yeah, didn't yeah, quite yeah. work out that way, and Chad grew no. up uh, okay, I think, you know. Hey, you, you're you're the director. They can't be telling you how to frame your own movie. Yeah, well. <laughs> you got you to gotta make the final call on that stuff. <laughs> right, so. yeah. Uh, yeah, man, another thing that I did want to definitely ask you about, um, like overall, the effects in this movie is uh, one of the things that I really enjoyed about it. Just a couple of ones that were big standouts for me that I just wanted to get a bit of a bit more information on for our viewers here. Um, so one of the favorite effects, obviously, of mine was the creature effects. Um, just how you put that creature together, how you got them to, uh, basically how you brought them to life. I mean, this is uh, before the time that digital effects were as overused as they are. A lot of things were still done practically. I was kind of interested how you put, uh, how you put that monster together, how it all worked out, and how much time it friggin' took, because I know that uh, sometimes that type of effects work can be uh, very time consuming for those artists. So a bit of insight there would be great. Yeah, uh, basically John Beekler and his team uh, created the monster. And uh, at that point, I knew that I wanted him to be like the stupidest looking pet that, that you could imagine. Yeah. And so John and I went back and forth because I wanted, you know, asymmetry in the face and the tentacle and the big eye and the little eye and the goofy grin. Uh, and John, you know, it was like something that was unusual to him and he didn't like the idea at first. And I of kept the, pushing him. Of the asymmetry specifically? Or? Uh, the asymmetry and just the goofiness of it all. Mm. Um, it, it, I mean, it was supposed to look like a gigantic booger or something like that. Right. Yeah. Conscious booger. 
Um, <laughs> so, so we fought about it a little bit, but to his credit, he and his yeah. team really put together this incredibly stupid yeah. and characterful creature uh, and then shipped it over to Italy where we shot the film. Oh, I had no idea it was shot. <laughs> yeah, at this point. News to me. Yeah, uh, at this point in time, yeah. Charlie Band owned the studio that was the Dino oh. De Laurentiis uh, studio just outside of Rome. I would and have so, had no idea. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, so basically, they put the creature together, shipped him over to Italy, and then reassembled him. Uh, <laughs> every day on the shoot, there was basically two people inside the creature kind of operating the eyes okay. and the mouth right, and move the tongue. Mm -hmm. A couple of yeah. other, another couple of people on the tentacle and the eye and other people kind of operating the tail of the creature. And before every shot, they had to kind of wet him down with this sex lubricant kind of the stuff. Goo, the uh, goo. The cellulose, <laughs> yeah. So uh, he was a big, messy thing on, on set. All the time. At some point, someone was probably wondering why you needed liters and liters of lube shipped to Italy, but, you know. They had a barrel full of it there on set, standing by at all <laughs> times. Um, and... <laughs> Basically, it was so hot because we were shooting in the summertime in Italy in a non-air-conditioned soundstage that we had to get a airplane uh, air conditioner and run it in to air condition the people inside of the creature because they were dying. Yeah, getting way too hot, eh? Makes yeah, sense, yeah. yeah. And uh, the other one that really stood out to me other than the creature, well, of course, there is uh, for your uh, effects guys that wanted to do something that was you know, a bit more traditional. They did have kind of a Star Trek uh, alien guy in there as well, right? Which that that looked really good. Like I really believed, uh, I really believed that. And another thing that I really loved was the uh, basically that their swimming pool. I don't want to spoil too much for people that do uh, end up watching this um, video and going and finding the movie. But there is a part where the swimming pool kind of gets infected with the the alien creature and his goo or whatever. And I just loved how. Um, that that pool looked, and I was like, "Man, this this looked like a lot of work to uh, to put this together." Could you tell us kind of what in what went into that effect? Yeah, the first of all, the the uh, alien garbage disposal manager uh, with the with the um, kind of reptilian face yeah. uh, was that was basically something that was a, a, an appliance that was in John Beekler's shop, and we you know because it was low budget Charlie Van World. We reused uh, effects from other movies, and so we basically oh, yeah. kind of preempted that that effect and uh, put it on an actor that lived in Italy. Uh, the swimming pool again. When I walked on those sets, uh, came uh, to Italy and and first kind of toured the sets. In the script, it called for you know the pleasure dome and the and kind of the Roman bath sort of uh, jacuzzi room. But uh, Giovanni Natalucci, who was the production designer, when, when he read the script, and he came to Los Angeles, and we did a lot of research about homes in the valley and swingers' houses and survivalists and all the kind of weird 1980s stereotypes that, that are kind of stuffed into the movie. Uh, he got so inspired that he went back to Rome and created this house, a multi-level house, erotic art, the little oh, wow. bar room, the the jacuzzi room, which was truly in the Roman style. So when I walked on the set and saw this, it was just spectacular to me, you know? It is really uh, cool. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the jacuzzi uh, had water in it, it was freezing cold, so when, uh, when Alejandro Ray got in it, he was shivering like crazy. Uh, but then we would fill it with uh, with a little bit of um, smoke effect, and then yeah. Beekler's guys uh, went after the deaths in the jacuzzi. Beekler's guys filled it with all these kind of leftover latex, barfy looking pieces. So yeah, it was quite a quite a lot of work. Yeah, I think you guys did do a uh, a great job with uh, definitely the budget that you had. Uh, remind me, what was the budget for TerraVision that you had to work with? Oh, I imagine it was probably a million dollars, million and a half. I oh, mean, it was bigger it. Wow. bigger budget than than you might think. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. we shot like thirty days, I think. And yeah, okay. it was like those in those days. Charlie had more money to spend on the movies. Yeah, was, you know. yeah, and. 
that's probably why you uh, ended up doing like the in studio shooting and stuff like that as well, right? Like, I'm pretty sure the entire movie is shot in in uh, in the studio. Uh, everything except the night exteriors of the house where the cars okay. keep piling up in the driveway. That was shot in a oh, neighborhood. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, you're right. There is that little bit that uh, that's not. But yeah, you did a great job of uh, of utilizing that that studio environment as well. And there are some like outside i was pretty impressed with that like the backyard shots and stuff oh, like uh -huh. that, yeah yeah you, there's like the blue lights coming up the back and it does it does uh trick your mind into thinking that you're outdoors you know when you're in the studio there and obviously it's easier to manage costs and stuff like that if you can do it uh in the studio like that but the house itself feels like very real very lived in uh what you would expect some weird 80s swingers to be living in so yeah yeah I'll, that aspect of it, uh, I definitely really enjoyed. Yeah, that was something that I definitely wanted to bring up was like the fact that uh, what you achieved just shooting everything indoors, that was pretty amazing. And uh, one other thing that I think every frigging movie should take an example from with this movie, you gotta have the theme song. And this, uh, movie, yeah. has, this movie yeah. has a great catchy theme song um, that would, I guess, uh, you were saying kind of the target audience of this movie is kind of those teenagers and getting them used to uh, this kind of genre of film, like the sci-fi or cult kind of genre. And uh, definitely throwing that theme song in there would make a big difference. I'm surprised that more movies, you have all these comic book movies and stuff coming out, and every time that they don't have a theme song, I'm like, this would be greatly improved by a theme song, you know, or just original music in general is something that's, uh, that's not really treasured as much as it used to, much like uh, practical effects and much like being able to make a good film without, you know, 50 million plus dollars. So yeah, uh, do you want to kind of explain a bit about uh, the theme song, where that idea came from? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, uh, when, it, when the film was edited and we were looking for a composer, uh, we, I don't know how we did this, but we got Frank Zappa in to oh. uh, screen the film with us. <laughs> and, cool. And Trump, trying to get him to do the, the music for the film. Uh, and he, when he saw, when he heard what the schedule was going to be, he kind of decided he, that wasn't for him. Um, and, and I can imagine what a different movie it would have been with a Frank Zappa score, you know? Um, I think it would have fit. Yeah, it would have been very amazing. But uh, at the time, also, the, the club where I was seeing Mary Warnoff, the club lingerie, uh, there was also a band that played there quite often called uh, the Fibonacci's. They were sort of like a new wave art band. Whoa. And uh, so, and I loved the, their lead vocalist and, and their music was so quirky and the composer uh, was really, you know, had a really great songwriting skill. Uh, so we approached them about doing the, the title theme and some of the incidental music in the film and, and they they took on the task, you know, so they created that incredible, catchy terrorism. Yeah, I honestly, song. I love it. I love it. It's like, it's so perfect. It fits the movie <laughs> uh, so well, sets the tone for the movie. And like I said, man, people are, are uh, squandering <laughs> potential by not having a, uh, a catchy theme song. So yeah, yeah, I think, I think they did. That one thing great. that they can definitely learn. Um, I guess the other thing that I kind of wanted to talk to you a, a bit more about was uh, just some more recommendations. Um, basically, I found this film because Ray had uh, had recommended it to me. I, if it wasn't for meeting Ray, I would have never heard uh, about this movie. I don't know why films like this, I guess, don't get talked about as much anymore, and there's not as much uh, small video rental stores and stuff like that that people can go to. I guess like. YouTube is sort of the replacement for that these days where people can go to be uh, exposed to some new movies. But are there any uh, any stuff from your back catalog or even anything in the kind of sci-fi horror genre uh, that you've seen recently that you might recommend? Uh, yeah, uh, basically uh, the movies that Charlie made, especially television. Television <laughs> came out uh, 1986, uh, mm -hmm. and on, I think on Valentine's Day, 1986, right after the Perfect. the shuttle Challenger exploded. So nobody was in a very good mood to go see a oh, science damn. fiction comedy at the time. Yeah. And the film was not marketed very well <laughs> and was hated by most critics who saw it. 
and so it basically got kind of trampled and and you know just was shat upon by most of the most of the critics around the country uh but a small group of young people saw it at the time in the theaters and over the years uh started seeing it on video and the ones that appreciated it turned their friends on to it and so over the years the the heartbreak of of its initial release kind of became like a real satisfaction yeah. that well that, just don't forget that even when psycho came out people hated that so yeah yeah sometimes it takes a little bit of time for people to appreciate something but and it was such a movie out of it out of the norm of movies that uh it's managed to kind of age in a way that's pretty you know it's still relevant in a way to uh to the media and to yeah. young people now and it's yeah, so i'm happy that it's found it's it's uh cult. Uh, some other movies that I did that also have a pretty good cult following, the subspecies vampire movies, yeah. uh, a, another production that I did for yeah. Charlie when he had uh, Full Moon. We went to um, Romania, to Transylvania, so it's the first, uh, and I was the first director to go over there after the fall of uh, Ceausescu. Yeah. I'll have to uh, check those out <laughs> uh, a little bit myself. The reason why I did, I, I think you're actually uh, more well known for the subspecies stuff. The reason why I just wanted to do uh, TerraVision kind of as an introduction, I thought it was uh, a bit more accessible, but now I will go back and uh, and check out those subspecies. How many of those uh, movies are there? There's a few, right? Four. There are four subspecies and kind of a... Uh, a spring off from subspecies called vampire journals okay and you you can find them all on uh, Amazon Amazon uh, uh, full moon has a channel on Amazon oh excellent and so all of those movies and all of Charlie's movies can be found there I did some nice. children's nice. movies something called remote about a kid uh, fighting off some burglars uh, with a bunch of remote controlled toys that's a nice movie and oh, kind of like uh, Home Alone. Home say. Alone, yeah, it was kind of like after Home Alone, Charlie wanted to do a Home Alone ripoff. Yeah, Home Alone, and uh, <laughs> a movie called Dragon World, which I think is maybe one of the better movies that I've ever made. Wow, okay, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna go and and uh, link all of those down in the description for anybody that wants to check those films out. And uh, since we're on the topic of other work that you've been doing. Uh, very happy to find out that you have not stopped, you have not slowed down, you're still uh, working on some films, some new projects, which uh, I'm hoping that uh, we get a lot of funding for these movies and get these movies made, get these uh, movies distributed. So some stuff that you've been promoting here that uh, I want to talk about. There's a film uh, right now tentatively titled uh, Girl by the Lake. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk too much about these. Uh, there's also uh, Saints and Fools, which will be hopefully coming out in the next few years. So I don't know how much detail you want to give on those, but uh, just to get people excited and maybe, uh, I don't know how you're planning on funding these as well, but if you have some kind of uh, some uh, GoFundMe or anything like that that you wanted to shout out, we'd be happy to do that as well. Cool, yeah. Uh, no, the, these are two scripts that I'm kind of, promoting right now that I've written over the last year or two. Uh, Girl by the Lake is like a supernatural shocker that, uh, like a ghost story, but with a serious twist ending. Cool. Uh, that uh, would be shot in Caddo Lake, Texas, which is a very mysterious kind of uh, submerged forest. And uh, Saints and Fools, I, I have this um, uh, desire to go back to Romania and do another film with um, Honest Hove, who was the actor who played Radu the Vampire in my vampire films, and a Romanian actor named Jan Duke, who was in the vampire films also. Uh, we've been talking about doing a movie together forever, so this would be like an art house comedy about awesome. grief that I'm hoping that, that is sort of the, the newest thing that I'm trying to put yeah. together. Awesome. Yeah, I think that uh, those two genres can really work together in a good way. And there's plenty of uh, classic examples of that. Obviously, like Ghostbusters would be one. And yeah, there's just tons and tons of opportunity, I think, for uh, for kind of smashing uh, comedy and horror together. Cabin Cabin in the Woods. I don't know if you've seen that film. But yeah, 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 yeah. Like, so a bit of like subverting the kind of horror genre and bringing some comedy elements into it. I really liked that movie uh, as well. So yeah, so that should uh, give everybody some recommendations. Uh, yeah, uh, go in and check out all of uh, Ted's films and hopefully we're going to get some 
new films from him as well, man. So Ted, I just wanted to. We hope so. Yeah, we hope so, man. Well, hopefully uh, I can do my small part to uh, raise awareness of your movies. And I really enjoyed Terror Vision here. And it's one that I wanted to spread the word about and definitely I'm going to go and check out some more of your movies. And I just, I appreciate you coming on the show so much, man. And, uh, and I think that we all learned a lot from having you on. So thanks again. Okay. Thank you, Jared. It's fun talking to you, man. Okay. See you. And uh, yeah, to all my uh, subscribers out there, thank you for joining us for this discussion. Uh, I really appreciate you guys watching as always. I love you guys and I'll see you guys next time.